Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. All right, really good to see you. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles today to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is in the Old Testament, more on the left-hand side of your Bible. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Um, it's a great people, a uh, great book. I love Proverbs because it's a great book for people who believe in God. But you know what? Also, it's a great book of, for people who don't believe in God. It's for everybody who just wants good, practical, common sense for living life out here in 2023. I know I need a lot of that. Um, page 541, if you're going to use the Bibles we provided, you're going to find it on page 541 down in front of you or underneath your chair. Proverbs chapter 18, where we will read one verse, just one verse in just a minute. Uh, my name is Kevin, along with my wife Jacinta, we're lead pastors here. We're so glad you made the decision to gather in today. Uh, speaking of the book of Proverbs, let me invite you into something personally that I'm doing for the month of March. So this is, in a, this is just a personal thing I'm doing that I'm going to invite some people into. In March, I'm going to be reading four chapters of Psalm and one chapter of Proverbs every day, okay? So this will, this will be our soap guide direction as well. Uh, for our guests today, we have a soap guide that we make available. Soap is just the way you can look at the acronym later. It's the way that we provide uh, the help for us to read the Bible together. Uh, we're going to be in March in the season of Lent. Lent is these 40 days before Easter where we uh, reflect on how fragile we are as humans and we confess the things that separate us from God's way of doing things. And I'm excited to uh, be able to read almost the entire book of Psalm, if we do it this way, almost the whole book of Psalms and the entire book of Proverbs in March. So that's just a little bit for free. Join me in that. We'll have those sub guides available next week and on Line. One announcement I did want to make uh, that's very exciting because I've been talking about making room here uh, at our 11 o'clock service especially, but really now at our 930 service as well, making room for other people to gather in by helping us launch a new service at our South Norwalk location, a new 930 a.m. English-speaking uh, service. And today I want to announce the date for that service that's starting. That way, as you're planning and deciding if you want to be a part of that, and that date is March 19th. March 19th, we will be starting our new English-speaking service in South Norwalk. Anybody excited about that? Amen. And Miguel is absolutely right. You'll see that we're making some progress here, too. We should have about 20 new parking spaces available very soon out there. And so we're doing everything we can to make room, and we're asking you to help us, uh, 25 to 50 people, help us to make a decision for three to six months to be at the 930 service in Sona. We'll talk more about that, and we're going to actually want you to sign up and let us know. We're not looking for general people to go there, but specific people, right? We want to know who's going there to attend and serve. So thank you for continuing to pray about that. Today is week number two of a series that we've called Love, Sex, and Relationships. I forgot to put that one word in there, uh, but, but I've been adding it every week because we are headed in that direction as well. We were created for relationships, right? We are relational beings, and I, I know I'm speaking for everyone here today when I say we need wisdom on navigating the most important relationships in our lives. Anybody else say we need some wisdom, right? Listen, if you've, got, if you've got all your relationships figured out, see me after, and you can preach next week, okay? I'll just let you right up here. Last week, we, uh, we kicked the series off by talking about marriage. We said marriage is the foundational example. Uh, we are given for relationships at their very best. Uh, we said that marriage is an example for all of us. Remember this, married or not, want to be married or don't want to be married, divorced or not. So if you missed last week, check that out online. You want that foundation. I always, by the way, get a lot of feedback when I uh, speak about two things. I get a lot of feedback any time I talk about giving and tithing, right? I always get a lot of feedback. And then I also always get a lot of feedback uh, when I, anytime I talk about marriage. And this last week was no exception. So I want to just, before we jump into week two and jump into the verse, I want to give a little bit of bonus material from last week, all right? A little bonus material. All right, two important things. I'm going to go quick that are counter cultural corrections to what we often hear about marriage and relationships before we jump into week two. First of all, everybody ready for number one? Everybody ready for bonus material? Seven of you, if, if at least seven of you are ready, we're going to proceed. Okay, that's okay. We got enough to go forward, right? First of all, everybody hear this. Marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. Everybody said, I'm sorry, I raised my hand. <laughs> 
Like, if, if you heard that about marriage, marriage is a 50-50 deal. If you heard that and you thought it sounded good, listen, discard it, reject it, move away from it, and nobody will get hurt, all right? Marriage is never 50-50. I don't have time to build on that ex- today except to say uh, marriage, what is in the Bible, what is marriage a human example of? of? Does anybody remember? It's an example of who? Christ with his church, right? Paul, the apostle, early church leader named Paul said, husbands love your wives, how the way that Christ loved the church, right? So believe me now, verify me later, it's there. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Marriage, marriage is a 50-50 thing? No, no, no. How, how did the percentage of effort work in the Christ church relationship? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, what percent of loving and acting and caring did Jesus do, and what percentage did the church do? How much did Jesus do, percentage-wise? 100%. Was it a 50-50 deal, see or no? Everybody say no. It was not. (laughs) So if you are, here you ready for it, if you are waiting on your spouse to do their part so that your relationship can be good, keep praying and believing. You can pray and believe for that. God hears our prayers. But your part is not for them to wait to act and not for them to wait for them to do their 50%. Did everybody get that? All right, that's bonus material number one. Second, advice from years and years of marriage counseling, both on the receiving and the giving end. Yes, Pastor Jacinta and I have have done a lot of marriage counseling, and we've received a lot of marriage counseling. By the way, marriage counseling is good. Marriage therapy is good. Everybody should be doing it, all right? Don't wait till you have problems to do marriage counseling. Do it before you got problems. I tell people when I get, they get married, I, I, I've, I told these two before they got married, when y'all get back from your honeymoon, about a month after your honeymoon, just schedule a marriage counseling session. Just jump into it right away. That's okay. All right, so here's advice. The number one thing, you ready? It's a silver bullet that will resolve 98% of marriage difficulty. Is this sounding good to anybody? Is for the people in the relationships to learn how to control their spirits. Two things I said that nobody liked. I'm two for two. The Bible, the Bible says it this way. He uh, says, control your spirits. We would today say, control your temper, control your attitude. Again, no time to dig in today, except this is bonus material, except to say, do all the meditating you want on your marriage. Do all the learning how to love yourself that you want to in your marriage. But if you really want to get things on track, track ask God for help in controlling your spirits. At least 12 people should be clapping. I want about 12 people. There we go. All right. <laughs> Bonus material over. We can move on. Today, we're going to talk about friendship. Let's read one verse from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to us today. We're all in such desperate need to hear from you. Please start with me, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. God, you're my rock and my redeemer. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said a big amen. Amen. So I want to start today by letting you know, letting everybody know here how good my life is going. All right, y'all ready? Everybody listen. I don't want to brag, but I have a lot of friends, okay? I have a lot of friends. Even more specifically, I have like almost 1,300 friends on Facebook, okay? I mean, this is big. This is big. As far back as 2005-ish, I only had about 100 friends, if I'm being honest. But now, 1.3K, y'all. I, almost, I also have almost 650 friends on Insta. Let's see it. Almost 800 on Twitter, not to mention some scattered friends on TikTok and Spotify. So many friends. I think we'd have to all agree that things are going pretty well for me, right? And no right? Uh, we, we all know, and if you don't know, learn it now, that you could have millions of friends on Twitter and Facebook and not have one solitary friend in the world. That's why I'm leading with sarcasm. This is sarcasm, in case y'all didn't get it right. Uh, I'm leading with this because all of this fake friend activity 
can make it easy to forget what real friendship actually is. That's what we're talking about today, real friendship. There, there's a shadow of friendship. I'm not saying these places are bad. Uh, there's a shadow of Some of you are here in this church because you found out about us on Facebook and found out about us on Instagram. They're not, there's a shadow of friendship. Can you meet people there who actually become your friends? Sure, I have and I will. You probably have, you probably will. But friendship is a special type of relationship. In fact, we're gonna put it on the screen. I want you to write this down. Let's call it a relationship. It's a special type of relationship, in real life relationship that brings joy, growth, and trust into someone's life. It adds joy to your life, helps you grow, and develops trust. You could even make this a litmus test for the best kind of friendships. When you have a real friendship, you have more joy, you have more growth, and you have more trust. And just last, like last week, we're going to leave this up for a few minutes because I want, you to, I want you to get this vision for the very best that this essential kind of relationship can be. Come on, somebody say essential. Let me hear you say, got to have them. I don't want anybody in this room to settle for anything less, anybody join us online, than anything less than everything God has promised you. So I want you to get this. We saw it in this verse that we read. Here's a vision for your life. Are you ready? There are real friends who stick closer to us than a brother, and we could add closer to us than a sister. And you don't even need to be convinced of this by seeing God's vision. We're going to show you God's vision for this. But we, have, we, have, we all know this innate need that we have. We have this need inside of it. It's core to who we are. Everybody wants a friend by their side, someone that we can laugh with, someone we can experience life with, somebody we can feel loved by. We, we all need to be loved by someone and need to love that someone in return. I saw a poll the other day that said that more than 50% of preteen and early teen girls, I think that they were looking at 12 to 14 year old girls primarily, said that they feel sad and hopeless most of the time. Why is this when we have this proliferation of online connections, right? We have this acceleration of online friendships, but what's the truth? What's real is that we end up with a whole lot of relationships that are based on very shallow foundations. Some of this is new to the age we live in. By the way, some of it's not new. I'm not blaming everything on the internet, right? Some of this is, this shallowness is ancient. People have always used other people to help advance their status in life or to make themselves more comfortable or just because they're flat out lonely. So I'm not blaming the advent of the internet for everything, but I want us today to see a distinction between God's vision for friendship and the friendships that we offered outside. Somebody say outside. Friendship that were offered outside of God's vision. The Bible describes friendship, listen, as deep and intimate. Listen, these are not just marriages now. I'm saying friendships that are deep and intimate. They're based on the example of marriage, but the Bible promises us access to relationships that go much deeper than all of these superficial connections that we can make. Let, let me just tell you what the Bible points to as the core components of true friendship. It involves, let's see this next screen, true friendship involves love, sacrifice, loyalty, and emotional involvement. This is what the Bible would point to. I want you to write that down. There is a as I put that up there, some of this is going to seem like words you've heard before presented in a sentence like you've heard before. And so I don't want you to miss, there's, there's a group of people in this room today that are going to walk away with a vision for seeking out and maintaining relationships like this, and it is going to change the entire trajectory of your life. I wish I was preaching this sermon 10 years ago. I won't go into the reasons for that because most of them are very personal, but I can't tell you how important what God is trying to say through this series and what God is trying to say today is God has promised us relationships that are based on love, sacrifice, loyalty, and emotional involvement. Now, there are several places we could examine to show this off. We could do a series called Great Friendships of the Bible. That sounds pretty great. But I can't pass up on making you know about one of these in general by looking at the example of David and Jonathan. 
David is an up-and-coming king of Israel, and Jonathan is the son of the current king who, who becomes David's enemy. You should really read the Bible. It's really, really the best book ever. But look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. As soon as he had finished speaking, this is David. He's finished speaking to Saul. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. In other words, Saul did not let David go back home. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. I'm going to stop there. David and Jonathan made a covenant with each other. This is what we're seeing here. All that we're seeing here, they are signs of a covenant. Listen, they are signs of the loyalty that they had between them. Somebody say loyalty. I'm afraid we don't talk about loyalty enough. When we're truly friends with someone, we can trust that they are going to be loyal to us. Right, write that down. If we're truly friends with someone, we can trust that they will be loyal to us. And let me just reverse your thinking really quick. I noticed this last week when I preached a sermon on, on marriage. What happens for some people is they're, they're starting to make a, they're, they're, as they're leaving, they're like, oh, okay, this is all the reasons that I need to stop being married to the person that I'm, that I'm married to because, because they're not doing any of these things. This is not what this series is about. All right? And let me, I want to reverse your thinking right now. I think in electricity they call, call it reversing polarity, right? And don't let your mind right now, everybody hear me? Don't let your mind go to all the ways your friends have not been loyal to you. This is not today about you making a list of the people you need to kick out of your life. Man, I just don't know if you're hearing this part. You're going to miss the point if you let your mind do that. So let me say this. When we are truly friends to someone, they can trust that we will be loyal to them. Did you get it? What do I mean? We, we can trust good friends to make decisions for us. We can trust them around our spouse. We can trust them around our other friends. Here's, here's a big thing. We can trust with our friends that their intentions are pure in their actions toward us. I love this story because Jonathan gave David his armor and his sword. And, and David, it said, went out and was successful. Get this. When we're truly friends with someone, we support them. We support them uh, in their entrepreneurial endeavors, right? When they start a business, we support them. We, we attend their kids' dance recitals, even though no one really wants to go to your kids' dance recital, okay? Some of y'all are just realizing this for the first time. They didn't want to come? No, they didn't want to come. They love you. That's why they came. Still, still invite them. It's fun. It's fun. You should do it. It's fun. Now, there are some weird people. Lauren likes going to people's dance recitals, but, but not everybody's like Lauren, okay? We trust them to be loyal to us. Watch this. Loyal in the way they pray for us. Y'all need some friends that will pray for you. The Bible calls it a special type of prayer. It's called intercession. We intercede. What does the interceding mean? It means we're praying on behalf of something or someone else. And intercession, by the way, is usually somewhat intense. True friends are loyal. Watch this. To forgive each other when they mess up toward each other. Forgiveness. It's the F word nobody wants to say. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. I'll say something about forgiveness. Matthew chapter, let Jesus say something about forgiveness. Then Peter came and said to him, this is Peter talking to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Sometimes I kind of, when I read this, I kind of think that maybe something was actually going on at the moment. <laughs> this is possible. And then Peter's like, he's got, I'm going to come up with a big number to really impress Jesus and show him how forgiving I am. As many as seven times, Jesus? Would it be that many times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. It seems like 
Jesus had David and Jonathan's loyal example in mind several times. For instance, look at what it says about these two, David and Jonathan, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 17. It said, And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him. Watch this. For he loved him. I want you to read this last line with me. For he loved him. Read it with me. As he loved his own soul. Would you say that with me again? As he loved his own soul. Does that last few words remind you of anything? It, it turns into something that Jesus is going to go with, and it's going to turn into something we call the golden rule. What is the golden rule? That you should do unto others, what? As you would have them do, do to you, right? Or another way to say it, love others as much as you love yourself. Friendship involves loyalty. We don't talk a lot about loyalty inside the church. We almost never talk about it outside the church. By the way, if you're a, a guest with us today, maybe somebody's here that maybe you wouldn't describe yourself as a church person. Maybe you wouldn't describe yourself as a believer. I hope this will be a help to you as well. By the way, you are welcome here. This is a place you can belong before you believe. Amen, everybody. And no matter where you are on your journey of faith, I, I know that you want to have the best kinds of friendships. So this is for all of us. Friendship involves loyalty. Here's the second thing. Write it down. Friendship involves sacrifice. We're not going to read the verse again, but we saw it in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. Jonathan is stripping off things that are valuable to him. He's stripping off his, his armor. He's taking off his royal robe. Listen, this is no small thing. This is nice stuff in Jonathan's life. Jonathan was a very rich young man. Jonathan could have given David a whole lot of stuff, but what did he give him? He th gave him the things that were most valuable to him. Now, there's more going on here uh, besides just the giving of gifts. It's more than just sacrifice of friendship. Uh, there, Jonathan was also an heir to the throne, and so uh, it, it, this was also a symbol that Jonathan knew that David was going to be the next king, and this is way, his way of saying, I see what God is up to, um, and I'm, not, I'm willing to give up my authority to be in line for the throne because of what God's done. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole today, but yes, that is going on here too. Listen, here's what I want you to get. Jonathan gave up what was most important to him and what was most valuable to him and what everyone else would have said, that's the most valuable thing that you have, Jonathan. Right? You Don't give away your armor. Don't give away your, your title. Don't give away your signs of royalty. Write this down today. A lot of us are willing to give our friends all the things we've got left over, but are we willing to sacrifice what we value the highest? If you read through the rest of 1 Samuel, you'll see that David's life, hear this this morning, it's a vision. I want you to have a vision of God's way of doing things as it relates to friendships as opposed to the, the friendships outside of God's vision. David's life went better because of Jonathan. Because Jonathan loved him with this sacrificial kind of friendship. Get this, it was an advantage for David to have Jonathan as a friend. Because of the covenant that they made, at least in part. We read about it already. There's more going on with David. I get it. But at least in part, because of this covenant, David became this super effective military leader. By the way, as David was getting more and more famous, John's, Jonathan's father named Saul, the current king, what was happening with Saul? Does anybody remember? Let me ask you this. Was, was Saul getting happier and happier because the kingdom of Israel was growing stronger, yes or no? No. He was getting jealous. <laughs> Get this. David got so famous that there was this song that the people of Israel was, would sing. You ready for the lyrics? Here's the lyrics. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It's a song you don't want to hear if you're the current king. What, what, what's going on here? A.K.A. David is the man. David's got the power. David's the new hip thing. We love David. David's the best. Now, it is not Saul, or it's not David or Jonathan's fault that Saul hated David. Uh, Saul evidently kept missing his therapy sessions, right? He could never get his act together. But, but Jonathan's sacrifice led to David's fame. Hear that today. I, I thought this clip... Uh, from the story of James Brown, all right? Get on up, connected to this idea of loyalty and sacrifice. Check it out.
what's happening here, context, James Brown is on the verge of making a big step forward in his music career, but what it's going to require a huge sacrifice from his, from his band. This happens a lot in music and entertainment, right? People who were his friends. And I play the clip today. There's a lot of ethical things that we should talk about, and, and there's a lot of going back. We could have a lot of fun talking about it, but I, I, I just want to wonder what comes to mind for you as, watch, as you watch the clip. I didn't show all of it. You can check the whole clip out on YouTube. But come to find out the band doesn't stick around and they aren't happy to make this kind of sacrifice. The question I want to put in front of you today is what would you feel like if a friend asked you to make this kind of sacrifice for them? The question I want to put in front of us today as we're considering a new vision for friendship Is this kind of thing too much to ask of a friend? I don't think we've done enough thinking about the sacrifice that's required if we're going to be good friends or if someone's going to be a good friend to us. Most of what I see online when I see people talking about friendships, specifically discarding of friendships, is that a whole lot of people who have gotten very good at abandoning relationships because the other person has become inconvenient or the other person doesn't allow us to live our truth, whatever that happens to mean, or they don't help us to love ourselves like we need to. Maybe it is tougher these days to connect and have good friends. Maybe technology and the distance that technology creates makes it harder. And, and, and I feel a heavy thing that's dropped in here, and it's okay for us to feel that heaviness. I wanted us to talk about friends here on Small Group Sunday because this is an essential part of who we are as a church. Many, many people, maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard people say it when they visit here. They say, man, the people here are so friendly. I just felt so welcomed here, or it felt like home when I got it. Anybody heard that said or said it yourself, right? It's okay to say that, right? Listen, this isn't an accident. It's not a happy byproduct. We are friendly because we believe that if we want to have friends, we must first be a friend. Amen. Here, something that makes me so sad as a pastor, Jacinta and I talk about it regularly, is to talk to people who are a part of our church, sometimes for years and years, and maybe they even serve here, and to find out years after that they are not connected in relationship with anyone. Here's something I know for sure about this church. If you're around here for any period of time and you don't have any friends, it's not because people don't want to be a friend to you. There's something else going on. By the way, uh, listen, I understand when I talk about uh, stepping out into these intimate, deep kind of relationships that some of you have some significant friend trauma that you carry with you. I understand that you've been hurt in, in deep ways, ways that you've really laid yourself on the line for others, and they hurt you, and they stabbed you in the back. So when I start talking about friendship, I know it's not always Easy, But there's something else going on. If you're around an area like this or an atmosphere like this and you don't connect in friendship. So this, by the way, is not about condemnation today. This is about giving you a vision for what God has made available to you. Nobody should leave here today saying, oh, I've been a bad friend. That's not the point. The point is to give you a vision of what God is calling us to. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. You've got a great chance today. Friendship requires loyalty and sacrifice and for you to be emotionally involved. And I won't spend a lot of time on emotional involvement today. I wish we had another half an hour. Oh, heck, two more hours would be great. We could just have a lot of time, all right? I read this this great article by A. Pawlowski called How Long Does It Take to Make a Friend? And uh, you should check this article out. It was digging into a study done by Jeffrey Hall, who is a professor at the University of Kansas. And in this study, the professor starts out by acknowledging what everybody should know by now, study after study show it, that non-family, non-marriage, non-romantic relationships are vital to human health and happiness. Everybody hear this? This is for the crowd here today that wants to say, well, I got my spouse and my kids and, and, and I'm all good. You're wrong. This was in the Bible way before any of us figured it out. There's no new news here. Here's one big reason to join a small group or two today. Everybody ready? Your life will go better if you do. You'll be happier, and you will be literally physically healthier. It's just a fact. 
Lots of science to back that up. But then he says this, quote, even though we know that, quote, yet people don't prioritize friendships. A lot of times our life becomes more focused on work and our immediate family. So he studied 355 adults and 112 college freshmen, and he wanted to know specifically how long does it take to make a friend? Like how many hours do you need to spend and how close do you end up feeling based on how much time you spend with them? You don't have to write these down. Here's the poll results. It takes about 40 to 60 hours of time together to form a casual friendship. To transition from casual friends to what he just calls friend takes another 80 to 100 hours. For people to become what he calls best friends or good friends, you're going to need to spend 200 hours or more together. Now, he makes a little note here. You get less credit for those hours if the hours were spent at school or work. Why is that? Because these are places you generally don't choose to be, right? So the best way, he said, to spend time, the best way to become a friend is just by being together and hanging out. He added that talking or chatting, it can help, but it's not absolutely necessary. How how many of you know some of the best friends, you can just sit with them, you don't have to say anything, you can just hang out, right? I like this line in the article, quote, small talk, on the other hand, seemed to be the enemy of friendship. People who talked about mundane topics became less close over time. Imagine that. The poll also revealed that we have been living in an epidemic of loneliness for many years now. The number of Americans that say they have no close friends, listen to this, tripled since the 1980s. The most common response people had when they were asked how many people they had in their life that they could discuss important matters with, the most common response was zero. On average, people had 150 Facebook friends, but only four that they could count on in a crisis. The survey is several years old now, but I believe if the poll was done again in this year, the results would be worse, not better. The, The professor offered three tips. This is not the point of the sermon, but three tips for making friends. Number one, go out and mingle small groups. Second, try a relationship in a new context, small groups. Three, make time with friends a priority, small groups. Y'all know you're getting a y'all know you're getting a hard commercial for small groups today, right? That's okay. Everybody should know that that's what's happening today. I hope you'd be disappointed if you didn't get it because everybody hear this. What we are doing as a society, how we are living, how we choose to prioritize our lives, and how we are choosing to pursue friendship is not working. Find me any study that shows any improvement in any of the most important areas of how we live our lives, and and I'll report it right back here in this same space. No, we are an isolated, increasingly disconnected, lonely, sad, and hopeless people, and our city, greater Fairfield County is our city, y'all. Our state and our country needs people to stand up and reject standard operating procedure and says when it comes to friendships, we're going back to basics. We need a people who will look at a relationship like Jonathan and David and idolize it and celebrate it. People who will lay themselves down the line for their friends. God is calling this church to be a light in the darkness. This is why I'm bold enough to do something like Make Room 2023 for more people to come in here. This is why we start small groups three times a year. We spend 32 weeks out of the year talking about them and pushing them and begging and trying everyone to be a part. This is why we we ask you to join the dream team and serve people who show up here. This is why so much of our energy is focused on giving you a chance to connect and relationships. Why? Because you can't flourish. You can't live the good life. You can't fulfill your calling. You can't even really be healthy without these relationships. I don't care how strong and independent you think you are, and you are an island unto yourself, and you don't need anybody. You are wrong. I don't know when you'll realize it. I hope most of you will receive this positive message 
that the scripture puts in front of us today. There are friends. There are friends. There are friends that God has in mind for us, and they are the kinds of friends that bring joy and trust and growth into our lives. Amen. Receive this vision today that you are a friend to other people. I'm praying that you won't leave here today doing an inventory of all the people that you need to kick out of your life because they didn't measure up to this new standard of loyalty and sacrifice and emotional involvement that we're seeing together today. That's not what today's about. But instead, we would leave today and say, God, would you make me this kind of friend? Would you make me the kind of person who loves someone else the way I want to be loved? Would you put me in the path of someone who wants to be loved and love me in return? Would you make me available? Would you make me a friend? God, make me a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The Bible says somewhere, I love this, that a brother is born for adversity. What does that mean? It means when things get tough, brother, you can count on me. Sister, count on me in the hard times. Yeah, hit a brother up when you hit the lottery, sure. But you can also call me when you find out your wife is leaving and not coming back. You can call me when you find out your kid doesn't want to spend time with you anymore. You can call me when you get that diagnosis or when bankruptcy is the next thing on your agenda. You can call me then. Get this, God created us to worship him, but Jesus showed up here on this earth not because we did such a good job of worshiping him and he just wanted to get closer to the action. That's not why he came. He showed up here. Why did he show up? Because we had messed things up beyond repair. Look at what this early church leader calls Jesus in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he, who is he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. If a brother is born for adversity, Jesus was born for adversity, literally born to die for us. Listen, sacrifice was not just a result of Jesus' earthly life. It was his destiny. It was his reason for coming. You've never seen loyalty like one who would say, Father, I don't want to go through this. I'd rather not go through all of this pain and suffering. But if this is your will, if this is what it takes to save lost sons and daughters of God, I'll do it. And he did. And he came and he stayed and he endured and he persevered and he overcame it. He wasn't deterred by any of the obstacles. He wasn't thrown off by any inconvenience. He was obedient even unto his death. This is our example of friendship. Let's hold that chord. I'll sing an old song. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Just hold that chord. Stay right there. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Pray with me now, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the example that you've given us of loyalty at its highest, sacrifice at its strongest emotional involvement where you chose to come here and be with us. You could have stayed at a distance and just sent random helps to us, but Lord, you came and you invested in our lives. You lived the life that we could not live, the perfect life. You've experienced every hurt, every pain, 
every inconvenience. Thank you, Lord, that you were not thrown off by the inconveniences and the obstacles that we put in front of you, but that you kept pursuing us, Lord. You kept coming after us. Thank you for the vision that you're putting in front of some people here today. At Broad River Church, there's going to be a stream of friends just flowing from this church into our city and into our county, into our state, a, a stream of people that were born for adversity, a stream of people that are rejecting the world's way of doing business and rejecting the world's way of discarding those things and those relationships that appear to be inconvenient. But God, you're calling us to a, a new level. You're calling us to a new place in our friendships. Thank you for that vision that you're giving to everybody in this room today. Thank you for the trajectory of people's lives that are going to be changed as they commit to being friends like this. Lord, we offer this to you today. I pray for a few people here today. I want to pray for a few people that maybe have never made the decision to follow Jesus. Today could be a momentous day for you as you just maybe say, I've heard what you've said today and somewhere along the way today, maybe as we're singing or maybe as I've been speaking, maybe even as you drove in and started interacting with, with God's people, you just had the sense that I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to make the decision to make him the, the ruler and the savior of my life because that's who he is. He is your savior. He came for you, died a brutal death, was buried and resurrected to new life specifically for you. He called your name even before you were born. He knew who you were. Today's not an accident that you're here. So if that's you today and you'd like to pray that prayer, everybody's head is bowed, everybody's eye is closed. If that's you today, I'd love to know who I'm praying with. Would you just lift your hand today and let me know who can I pray with today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Church, would you just join me with those that have their hands lifted today and we'll pray this prayer. Repeat it after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Thank you for coming for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for your resurrection and the new life that I have in you. Now I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Turn me back to you. I want to follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you're standing today, could we just give God a big praise in this house for what he's done? Come on, give God a big praise today.